Välkomna allesammans till det här seminariet. Det är ungefär bara det jag tänker säga på svenska. Det här är ett seminarium som hålls på engelska eftersom vi har en internationell panel här på scenen. Welcome everybody. This is a seminar held in English due to the international panel here on stage. The headline is Muzzle by the State, National Threats to Freedom of Expression Online. My name is Hans Rosén. I'm a journalist at DN.se, which is the website of the newspaper Dagens Nyheter. And DN.se is arranging this together with the Foundation.se, who is the host of the conference, Internet Dagarna, Internet Days. I will start with a few an introduction to the topic. Um, of today's discussion, then I will uh, present to you the panel. Uh, then we will move on to a discussion here on stage, and uh, we will round up with uh, 10 or 15 minutes or so with uh, an opportunity for you, the audience, uh, to ask questions to uh, the panel. Uh, maybe some of you were here uh, during uh, Gillian York's uh, keynote. Uh, earlier, uh, that was a um, great introduction to to this discussion with with a lot of facts. But I would also uh, like to make a few remarks um, uh, introductory by myself. Uh, I, I think it's uh, important to remember the reason that we are here at a conference called the Inter Internet Dagarna, Internet Days, uh, talking about these issues, um, censorship and freedom of expression is the fact that the internet is uh, political in a deeper sense than uh, most technologies, <laughs> probably, maybe, if not all. It has uh, placed in the hands of billions of people around the world the most pow powerful tool uh, for expression and for disseminating inf information that we have ever seen. It's not only powerful, it's also fundamentally promising uh, from a democracy perspective. It gives citizens the possibility to exchange ideas, form alliances, and enhance uh, transparency and accountability in public affairs. And this has to do uh, not only uh, with how the technology is used, but, but also the, the uh, specific technological design of the Internet, such as distributed resources, the capability of carrying all kinds of digital content of the users uh, choice, ideally at least, and the open multi-stakeholder uh, model for governance. But the history of the internet uh, has nevertheless shown us that uh, this promising vehicle for freedom can be turned around and used for uh, the opposite purposes, as uh, Gillian uh, told us earlier here. Governments, governments feeling threatened meet democratic challenges with digital weapons crafted from the very same technology. Thus, the technology for freedom becomes a technology for repression. And right now, as we meet here in Stockholm today, the battle between those two forces, those two antagonistic ways of putting technology use, to use, is being waged around the globe. Uh, and in principle, the dividing line is uh, clear. But uh, as I think we will be able to highlight here in the discussion, in practice, it's not always, always obvious who is defending and who is stifling free speech. There is also a comp always a complicated balance between freedom and security. But these oppressors, they do meet a steadily growing wave of digital activism. And many people pay a high price for taking a brave stance in this struggle one of them are with us, uh, with us here on stage today. Uh, some are being forced to flee their home country. Others are being jailed, tortured, and even killed. And I think we should keep that in mind today. Uh, there is also a growing number of states that are being engaged in this issue of freedom of expression online uh, at the diplomatic level, and we will dig into that more uh, in shortly. So, at this seminar, we will try to paint a picture of how this battle is being fought right now, with a special focus on 
<clears throat> how all too many states try to take control on a national level of the global network. Because even if it's a global network, there exists considerable means on a natural level to control and stifle the flow of information. Um, we will uh, discuss what is censored, how is it done, and what are the consequences, and what are the counter countermeasures. And we'll dig into these important issues with the help of a most distinguished panel, uh, DN.SE, myself, and uh, the Foundation.SE are very proud to present to you four persons who bring not only deep knowledge to the discussion, but also personal angles and experiences. Uh, some of you might have uh, attended uh, the session before, and then you are familiar with Gillian Jork over here at the left, uh, Director for International Freedom of Speech at the Electronic Frontier Foundation which is an advocacy group for citizens' rights online, based in San Francisco. Uh, she also writes regularly on these issues for uh, Al Jazeera, for example. Then we have next to uh, Gillian, we have uh, Christian Christensen, a professor of uh, media and communication studies at Uppsala University. He has a PhD from the University of Texas at Austin. He is the editor and co-editor of a number of forthcoming books one of them with the title Twitter Revolutions, Political Activism and Dissent in an Age of Social Media. <coughs> uh, next to Christian, we are very happy to introduce to you Afra Nasser, journalist and blogger from Yemen, forced to leave her home country after her reporting on the uprising in Yemen, made her a target for harassment and threats from pro-government group, groups. Afra is currently living in Sweden as a political refugee and studying media at the University of Södertörn. Finally, but not the least, next to me, Olof Eren Krona, a senior advisor to uh, the Swedish Minister of Foreign Affairs, Carl Bildt, on globalization issues. Olof is also deeply involved in the, uh, uh, Sweden's diplomatic efforts to promote freedom of, ex uh, freedom of speech internationally. So, welcome for all four of you. We are so pleased to have you here with us today. Uh, I would like to start with turning to Afra. Uh, you um, are a journalist and blogger who have personally, a personal experience of uh, what it means to exercise and defend the right to freedom of expression online, both as a citizen, a democracy activist, and a professional. Um, can you tell us a little bit what kind of problems you did meet in Yemen that in the end uh, led to that you have had to, to leave your home country and come to Sweden? First of all, I'm very thankful for having me here and um, uh, having the importance to have a voice from Yemen, which is mostly uh, not included in such uh, prestigious seminars. Uh, I would begin with uh, like a recent uh, aha moment I got uh, while uh, having my class in uh, uh, media production at the Turin Hogeskola. Uh, she t the teacher told, told us, uh, have an assignment and, and raise your own questions. It was uh, a reflection assignment about uh, uh, stupid net and the role of internet in the current uh, technology, uh, technological development. And she said, raise your own questions and put your own analysis and question the text that you have. And for me, that was like, I was screaming inside me, like, this is too good to be true. Am I allowed to raise my own questions? And I was looking around to my uh, classmate and everyone like was cool with what she was saying. And I was like, do you hear her? She told us to raise our questions. So raising questions, uh, uh, it's no, no. It's a big no in dictatorship uh, regimes. Starting from the educational system, I was always encountering uh, just to be silent and not question. Uh, when I was in college, when, was my, uh, when I developed my uh, humanitarian c conscious and my interest about what's going on, I was always like having a critique, but I was also faced to be silent. 
So I didn't have like the chance to discuss and, and speak out. So I turned to writing, which was my own passion. Never day uh, goes by without me writing in my own diary. And I came to know about uh, uh, Blog Safir. Uh, this is in 2008, and I was like very fascinated with, with the, the, the blogging movement in Egypt. And I, I, I attribute all my, my work because of them. They're the ones who really influenced me in the beginning. So I, I thought, OK, I could start my own blog, but I never thought that I will I will be like an active blogger uh, with people hearing what I what I what I write, but I, I was writing like uh, just um, random thoughts uh, only about cultural social stuff, and then I started uh, uh, I joined uh, the new, the newspaper in, in Yemen and I was working as a reporter, and my taboo was or my limit was uh, from the newspaper and from the the. Uh, the community around me and family is to write about anything except politics. So I, I wrote, I reported about social and cultural uh, topics, and the more I reported about them, the, the more I realized it's all about politics. Uh, I got uh, the chance to go to Denmark and have one month uh, uh, program uh, fellowship program uh, where I studied uh, the role of media in the democratic process. And they, and I got like uh, a good knowledge about all what I can do through my own blog. And I knew that it was a very powerful communicative tool. But too bad they did not tell me that I could get harassed and threats <laughs> from that. Mm. I wish they t they told me I could have changed things. But uh, I I I I took it and and I was uh, I realized that I have a power uh, with. Uh, the power of words and the power of discussing uh, those crucial political issues. So when, when the revolution in Tunisia took place, for me, it, it, it was like it sparked everything in me. And, I was, and my first political uh, uh, blog post was, I, I wish I were Tunisian. And I was openly writing. And I, I remember exactly the feeling I was like, shivering while, ty while typing, because it was a matter of life or death. And I knew it could bother a lot of people, because we have a long history in Yemen where the authorities could go after uh, outspoken journalists questioning the authority and challenging the power. So you realized that you were taking a risk here. Exactly, exactly. But, uh, but uh, when you see, and then uh, things went uh, like uh, in Egypt, uh, Yemen, uh, Syria, Bahrain, uh, Libya, and all all the protests. Wall Street, uh, Occupy Wall Street, and all the protests, the global protests. So for me, I I was like I I, I felt like I was part of a global uh, movement. And when when you see the sacrifices and the bloodshed that took place. It doesn't matter anymore if you blog and you get harassed and you get death threats and you get abandoned by uh, your community for what you stand for. Um, so that's in short about what really inspired me to like continue writing and, and discussing those issues. And, and even uh, while I'm in Sweden, uh, I still have a good position where I still can be uh, a bridge for to be a voice of the voiceless mm -hmm. and 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 write about what the international media is not focusing on because it, when when it's al qaeda or when it's uh, about uh, any uh, when a bomb happens here or there all the international media will, will go and report about that but what about the humanitarian stories mm -hmm. what about the suppression, or what about the, the current uh, counter-revolution that, that's taking place inside Yemen? Just recently, we had, uh, um, this is uh, within the, the past couple of months, Bushra al-Maqtari, she's uh, a female uh, writer who was discussing uh, uh, what the authorities, uh, it, she wrote about what the authorities uh, committed of a horrific crimes against the protesters in Ta'az province, which is a small province that does not get the attention that Sana'a gets. And she got physically attacked by, by another, the so-called pro-revolution from Islah party. And so th those kind of issues, like someone should, should write about that. And I, I have the urge to, 
I cannot, I cannot be silent. Mm -hmm. That's my problem. But the attempts to silence you, they were mostly, they were threats that came to you, uh, as you have told me before, not, uh, not directly from the uh, government or, or government agencies or so, but from loyalist groups. Given the fact that Yemen uh, is consisted of agricultural uh, tribal system, uh, where uh, the the state does not have much power over over individuals. Uh, so if 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 I irritate one person from one tribe, he he will bring all his uh, uh, tribe members, and they will like do any. They will harm me. And uh, on the other hand, I don't have anyone to turn to. Uh, I, I was raised by a single mother, and we don't have, uh, I'm not like affiliated to a big tribe. Uh, and I don't believe in that, mm. that kind mm. of thinking, uh, in the, uh, like in principle. So uh, the state does, will not give me any protection. So my, my problem is not with the, the authorities. It's my problem with not getting the protection that mm. I, I mm. could uh, have and no one does. It's not about me only. In fact, I could get like a better protection because we, uh, as a tribal um, uh, entities, we have uh, a tendency to like not not be open in in harassing women. They have we uh, in in the Yemeni culture there there is a bit of uh, um, like uh, grace with the the way you deal with uh, with the lady. I mean, speaking about uh, uh, like the harassment uh, f from strangers and um, so other other journalists uh, uh, could really get like could be directly harassed and threatened and and kidnapped and we have so many cases of that. So yeah. I've seen that and I, and that's alarming. Mm. Thank you, Afra. Uh, Gillian, um, do you recognize this, the, the, this story of Afra from, from uh, other countries around the world? You mentioned in your keynote speech the, the work you're doing now, trying to highlight uh, bloggers and, and internet users uh, being arrested around the world. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, I, I absolutely recognize what Afra said because it's it's not unique to Yemen um, where you would have non-governmental threats um, from groups that are either supporting the government or just supporting the system as it is. Um, but in terms of threats to bloggers, I mean, this... And, and again, bloggers at this point is not just people who write on a blog, but also, you know, I kind of use it as a catch-all term for mm. people using Twitter or Facebook or what have you. Um, and it is really a global phenomenon now. Some of the countries that we've seen kind of really increase their repression of bloggers over the past couple of years are not the ones that you think of. I mean, China and Iran have remained steady in their repression, but Vietnam has cracked down so heavily in the past year. That's a country to watch. Ethiopia is another country to watch, which I forgot to mention in my talk. Um, but you've also got... You know, Egypt, I mean, it's, it, I'm glad you mentioned Egypt because that was a country where, you know, I mentioned that they really didn't censor the internet that much, but they went after bloggers and they would try to go after them in different ways. And so um, one blogger whose case is pretty well known, he's a friend of mine, Al Abdel Fattah, he was arrested originally in 2006 for taking part in a protest, which he did. But they knew who he was. They knew his blog. He had the most popular blog in Egypt. And so he was a very easy target to serve as an example. And then once you've arrested a prominent blogger, the result of that is that other bloggers will censor themselves out of mm. fear. Mm. And so we've seen that in a number of countries. Mm. Do we have a tendency, when we talk about censorship online, we, we tend to think about technology, but, but this is a, a censorship in the physical world, try to stop people to use the net. Right, and in a way, I mean, from a governmental perspective, it's easier and cheaper to do it that way. Mm. Censoring the internet, especially if you, you know, if you're a country like Sudan, for example, which has pretty low internet penetration, under 10%, it's not necessarily economical to censor the internet technologically. You're better off going after a few key people, setting an example, scapegoating them, so that mm. everyone else is terrified of speaking up. Mm. Thank you, Gillian. Uh, one of the uh, developments, developments this, year's, uh, this year when it comes to freedom of expression online is the dip diplomatic efforts um, by, uh, for example, Sweden and the uh, United States and a, f a few other countries um, to defend freedom of speech uh, in uh, the, the UN context, for example. Um, Olaf, you've been involved in this. 
Uh, and this summer, the, the uh, Human Rights Council of the UN uh, adopted a resolution uh, concerning freedom of expression online. <laughs> uh, can you tell, tell us uh, about this uh, resolution and, and why it, you, the, you thought this was important? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, well, what happened was actually that we got, for the first time, we got a UN institution uh, explicitly saying that human rights offline should also be applicable online. And it was particularly mentioned in Article 19, that is the freedom of expression paragraph in, in, in the UN um, uh, Human Rights Declaration. And um, it was adopted by consensus. Not that everyone actually agrees. I think we should be realistic enough to do that. But it showed that those who agree have such a momentum, so those who did not actually agree did not dare to take the vote. I won't mention any specific names, but you, can, you, can, you, can, uh, you don't need that much fantasy to, to see who they are. Uh, and we had 85 co-sponsors co behind that resolution. So, uh, I mean, that is more or less half of the, half of the United Nations. So that is uh, a very, very important uh, um, stand taken by the United Nations. Um, and uh, it was, so to say, a, 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 not a final stage, but a, some sort of a, 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 a finalizing of a part of the, of the long march through the institution that we are now, now going with regard to, to protect freedom on the internet. Uh, we started uh, sponsoring Frank LaRue, who is the United Nations Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, uh, a couple of years ago, started to sponsor his work with a report to the Human Rights Council. And then, after a number of steps, we ended up with this resolution. Let me say, then, that we have two kinds of problems here. We have the political problem. That is, uh, authoritarian regimes or dictatorships that do not want to empower people politically because they are against, uh, against democracy. But we have also another problem, and that is a cultural problem. And that is what, 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 to a certain extent, what you also describe. You describe both of the problems with regard to Yemen. And that is that uh, with the internet, rather backward societies are suddenly entering in an absolutely very, very uh, mind-boggling process of modernization. And uh, I would say that the group that is most, most in focus here and ha really is, is, is needs to have their rights defended are uh, very often women. Because women, uh, when women speak up through the net, they uh, symbolize a liberation of, 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 of uh, women that is very, very, very provocative in certain societies. And this is so far something that we have not, I think we have not dealt enough with. We should deal more with it. But uh, it, the empowerment is in two dimensions. It's the empowerment that comes from your, you're able to speak out and you have the freedom of expression. But the other empowerment, which is just as important, is the empowerment you get when you have access to information, access to content of the net. <coughs> And you use the content and you have the access to the content to, to underpin what you express then on the net. And of course, this is as, exactly as you said, it's a norm, very, very promising uh, from, from uh, all respects if you believe in democracy and pluralism and, and freedom of the individual. But of course, it's also a threat to the existing elites. And we have, during the last years, seen Censorship from countries um, uh, increasing about 10 times. I will say that say it was a hand few countries 10 years ago that actually censored the internet because they didn't see the potential. Today we are at least 40 countries that do it. And of course this is a worrying, worrying development and we need to reverse the trend. Uh, Gilia, what do you make of this? Will such a UN resolution have any effect on the, those uh, oppressive regimes that are censoring? Well, I think that one of the challenges here is that repressive regimes often look to the West and point to every little bit of censorship that they undertake. And so when Germany, as they did last week, 
demands that Twitter take down an account for having uh, promotion of Nazi content, it's really easy for China, for example, to point to that and say, ah, but they have, it's important to them to censor certain types of content as well. And so obviously, you know, without equating that type of speech with important political speech, I think we still have to look at how these different countries play off one another in that sense. And so um, do I think that a UN resolution will cause the most repressive regimes to not censor the internet? Probably not without serious political change as well. Um, but I do think that Western countries need to do a much better job of leading by example than they're currently doing. Hmm. Thank you. Another part of the digital agenda of, of Swedish foreign policy and also US foreign policy is the support, um, the aid to, to uh, a, a network activists, sometimes called hacktivists. I know, Christian, that you have studied this a bit. Mm -hmm. Uh, what can such aid achieve when it comes to freedom of expression? I think what's interesting when we look at support for net activism, one of the things that's happened in the last year was that when the current Swedish administration began to discuss the possibility of giving financial aid to net activists, I think the parameters were somewhat different. We were talking about regime change two years ago or, or a year ago, and now those, many of those regimes, for example, <laughs> Mubarak, have gone. So then the question becomes, how do you utilize resources when you're attempting to topple a dictator versus the utilization of resources for long-term democratic development? Because they're two quite different things. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is you see a very, very rapid series of events. And what I was, the original piece that I wrote about a year ago, I mean, I was somewhat critical of the current Swedish administration because I, I felt that there was a slightly sort of techno-utopian discourse going on within policy that didn't take into account some of the things that Jillian was talking about. Um, and also, I think the complex interrelationship between uh, foreign policy in relation to freedom of speech and net activism. And then also, of course, government's role <laughs> in the promotion of businesses. Mm -hmm. national businesses, if it's Ericsson or Telio Sonera, and we, we know, as Jillian also mentioned in her talk, mm -hmm. I mean, there have been several instances where questions have been raised about the use of surveillance technology provided by these companies. And what you see then is an extremely complicated interplay between foreign policy goals on the one hand, and of course the, the, the idea of the promotion of the export of Swedish products, we want to put it in quotation marks. Mm -hmm. um, so what I've noticed is that this, uh, what I saw at meetings maybe about a year and a half ago, I think that the context has changed quite, quite dramatically because a lot of the countries that were being discussed at a meeting even 18 months ago have non, now gone through, mm -hmm. if not a regime change, at least a sort of a, a, a restructuring of their political system. Mm -hmm. And so the question then becomes, the money that has been allocated 18 months ago for X is now being used for Y, and are the two <laughs> things the same? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, and just quickly to sort of make, to follow on from Jillian's point a little bit in terms of leading by example, I think that actually, I mean, France, I, find, I heard today, uh, actually had also had a Twitter ban enforced. Um, and um, I think that there are more serious examples actually than Twitter as well. And, and that is, for example, the United States and the, the Bradley Manning case with WikiLeaks. Which we, we'll come back to that. And I just think that these, these kinds of things get left out of mm. a discussion about mm. net activism. Mm. And we see these things as being issues strictly related to certain parts of the world, mm -hmm. whereas actually they're very, very integrated with domestic politics, mm -hmm. which I think tends to be cut off in the discussion. Mm. Thank you, Christian. Um, Afra, what do you say about aid from the Western countries to, to uh, uh, countries, uh, non-democratic countries? What, what could the West do to help promote freedom of expression? What was the best Well, I, wa I was listening to what you were saying both, and I was thinking about what, uh, what I call the schizophrenic Western uh, empowerment for internet and, uh, and giving and, and creating a very high developed surveillance uh, softwares to dictators. And in the same time, we have like such uh, a nice seminars where we discuss about <laughs> the importance of internet and the democratic process. And that's for me, that, that's a double standard. And, and I, what I know for sure is that uh, oppressive communities uh, just need the tool to express themselves, and then they will take care of themselves. I mean, the fact that, uh, that we're discussing this freely, and I'm not going out from here feeling, feeling fear of my life, uh, by itself is a very like, uh, confirming or promising uh, um, <coughs> gesture uh, in Sweden that 
yes, we do still have like uh, a very transparent discussion about what's really going on uh, about uh, uh, freedom of expression and freedom of internet and and and. And by when you say tools, uh, you mean technological tools, but uh, I, you have mentioned to me earlier also education as an important thing here. Well, yeah, the the education or uh, giving uh, some kind of guidance of uh, how to do the how-to uh, mm -hmm. tools are uh, very, it, it's like an investment for a long time. Uh, not just uh, having uh, uh, regional conferences here or there. I, what I would like from like um, the, the, the developed uh, side of the world is to help developing countries with giving them the tools and going there with a learning mind uh, of what those communities really need to, to, uh, like to enhance uh, their democratic uh, environment. I mean, for me, if I, if, I, if I knew in Denmark about the, the harassment that I could get, uh, I could have to taken uh, another battle, I would say. Um, and and when, when I speak about uh, there is one important uh, issue I, I must... Uh, mention uh, when I speak about internet in Yemen. Um, the internet users in Yemen, it's between one to three percentage only. Mm. So it's not, it does not make, uh, uh, it's really not important there. We have uh, are nearly half of the population are illiterate. Um, so what, what computers or internet are we talking about for, for such a country? Um, but at the same time, um, the internet is very important for Yemen to link it to the international public and to the international media. And that was uh, the case for me and the other um, uh, English speaking uh, online activists. Uh, since Yemen is like, it's not seen in the map uh, and it's isolated most of the time. And um, no one knows where the hell is Yemen. And I often say it's next to Saudi Arabia, to next to Oman. They ask me, what is Oman too? <laughs> like, so since Yemen is uh, a mysterious country, uh, it was very important to use the internet to link it, mm. to 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 speak about uh, Yemen for for uh, the public, the international public. So that was very important for how. The, the role of internet in 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 getting Yemen introduced to the to the to the West or to the world, but in the same time we have several um, incidents where the internet is really uh, carefully monitored by the authorities inside Yemen. Tawakkul uh, Karman, the Nobel Peace Prize uh, laureate, her website, uh, the the journalist. Um, uh, associate, association, I forgot the name, but her, her NGO, uh, NGO's website was blocked for a long time. I remember when I was reporting uh, as a reporter in the newspaper, I couldn't, I couldn't get information for, from her. Uh, each time I opened her, her website, it's blocked. And there is also another uh, um, leading uh, feminist activist, Amal al-Basha. She has uh, uh, the sisterhood uh, uh, NGO where it's a watchdog uh, NGO uh, <coughs> monitoring all violations of human rights. And her website has always been blocked, let alone of the other incidents of, uh, like, Yinni uh, website is blocked, she just told me about that. And other, uh, other websites, intellectual ops websites, are also blocked. So for the authorities, it's very important to know the content online inside Yemen. But for the community or the, the, the mm -hmm. grassroots, it really does not have uh, no. a lot of uh, uh, impact. Mm. Uh, Olof, you wanted to comment on this. Yeah, I, I think it's very important to, to understand that uh, you have to, uh, to make a difference between what you're doing technology, uh, with the technology. You, I mean, all technology can be misused. Uh, this goes also for this one. And um, uh, when I mean, we are very clear on what Ericsson is doing in, 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 uh, in all countries, and we are very clear on what they are not doing. I mean, they are not doing what, what they are sometimes suspected to do. Uh, but we believe it's very, very important to have cell phones in countries like Yemen, for example. 
and we need more cell phones, and we need more technology in order to empower people even more. But we must also, on the political level, be prepared to tell certain countries that there are legislation that are perfectly okay in open societies, where you have transparency, democracy, parliamentary control uh, of the agencies, etc., etc., that is not okay in countries like uh, some of the Central Asian countries, for example. In dictatorships, we cannot accept a kind of surveillance legislation that we can accept in our societies, because uh, we have had uh, surveillance in Sweden since the Second World War. That has been a very, very crucial instrument in order to protect the freedom, the free society, the democracy, and the openness. It was used to protect us against the, the, the Nazi Germany in the 40s, and it was used in order to protect us uh, towards the, 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 the threat from the Soviet Union in, in, in the 50s and 60s. So uh, this, this has been an important part of the protection of the open society. And this sort of protection must also be, be, uh, must also be, uh, be able to be used in, uh, for other countries, open societies. But of course, we do, do, do not accept it, 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 the misuse of this technology in dictatorships. And we, we must be much more, cl more clear on this in the international dialogue, that it's not only a question of having a free and open internet, it's a question of having the whole kit in the final end of democracy, openness, freedom, transparency, individual uh, empowerment, etc. And I think that, is, that link is very, very important to state. And the technological development makes this, takes all these issues up in the air in countries where we used, we used not to, or we, we, we used to forget, actually. So I think that is, that is one very, very important aspect on the discussion side. The other aspect, I think, is also we must understand that there are different contexts in different countries. The reason why uh, they have this uh, view on Nazi propaganda in Germany is quite obvious, because the context for Nazi propaganda in Germany is not very good. And uh, they have a, 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 a... Germany is, I would say, the only country in the EU, I believe, I think so, or, well, the, the, they have actually uh, forbidden a polit polit Nazi political parties, and I believe that they also have actually forbidden the communist parties in, in, in Germany still. That would never be allowed in Sweden. We could never s say that we could for forbid a party, even how t totalitarian it is. So, because we... We, we um, do not accept uh, what people are doing, but we accept what people are thinking. And, and, but, but here's the difference. You can go to Turkey, you can see the same difference there uh, between uh, the secularist tradition and the emerging uh, Islamist uh, revival in, in Turkey. Uh, and you have this discussion. And those contexts could never be used to legit to me, my, uh, or, or to give legitimacy to uh, dictatorships or authoritarianism. But we must also, within the family of democracies, understand that there are different contexts. But we should not accept that the Swedish legislation on children pornography are used by certain countries in order to defend censorship in other areas. Um, I'm sorry, I, I, I love this talk, but at the same time, I feel like uh, very sorry for my fellow activists uh, in Bahrain where uh, activists are being dragged from their home uh, because of surveillance uh, uh, systems in their uh, uh, mobiles or computers, because Sweden and other Western countries are selling a very high developed surveillance well, software. We, we don't sell that equipment, I can tell you. That one's a US company. Well, I can tell you, we do not sell that equipment. We know exactly what equipment it is. And I can tell you, we do not sell that particular equipment. But on the other hand, all cell phones can be tracked. And that is always the problem. And all, all electronic uh, communication leaves tracks. And that is, that is, that is the, a, a problem. You always have these electronic tracks. And that, what I would, would listen to, what you said, was very, very important. Give education 
so you can protect yourself from this kind of surveillance. Uh, that is program, we have those kind of programs. Uh, but I would not isolate Bahrain, which is the alternative. I can protect all the activists in Bahrain by isolating Bahrain, cut down all the telecommunication system. I think that is not the good way to do it. But education, yes, absolutely. And do not export these particular surveillance equipment that we talk about. We don't do it to, 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 to countries like Bahrain, or, and because I don't think it's even not, not even in the Ericsson product scheme, actually. Well, but, but around like, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, around like uh, one year ago, there was a, a huge controversial uh, news uh, about uh, uh, the Swedish uh, government did not sign uh, uh, within the European Union uh, uh, there was a discussion to put uh, a law against uh, Ericsson company to sell uh, softwares for the Syrian uh, regime. The sanctions. The sanctions. The sanctions. Yeah, but but, but that, was, that was also wrong, actually. What we did was uh, absolutely accepting increased sanctions on telecom, but on the particular equipment that can be used for surveillance. But what we did not want to was to close down the cell phone net in Syria because the cell phone networks were used by the opposition in order to, to show what happens in, in Syria. And um, uh, this has been cleared, uh, said loud and clear. It was not, a, uh, for Ericsson, I think it's, I mean, they don't, the, the operations they have in Syria is very, very tiny operations compared to what they are doing. Uh, but they do not want to leave Syria because they want to be there if there will be a change. And I think that's a decent argument. Uh, we took our position based on the fact that we want to preserve the means for communication for the Syrian opposition. And we do, we do not want to, just from domestic political reasons in certain EU states, do something that is harmful to the people of Syria. And that goes also when we discuss the same thing in Iran. We are discussing financial sanctions with Iran. We say we will not have those kind of sanctions that makes it impossible for people here in Sweden with Iranian relatives to send money to their relatives. We do not want to have sanctions that wipes out the middle class, the entrepreneurial middle class as we did in the, it did in the Balkans. We want smart sanctions directed to the people in the government and the responsible people in the agencies. And this, I'm sorry to say, but this kind of discussion that we sometimes hear from the EU is, I would say, more disinformation than information. I'd, I'd like to respond to two points. That one yeah. first, because I actually, I, now, and I don't know the intricacies of the Sweden situation, but I, I do actually agree with Sweden's position here, and, and there's a reason. In the US, um, we don't have good regulations preventing the sale of surveillance technology, but our sanctions on Syria, Iran, Sudan, a couple of other countries have actually for years prevented opposition activists from getting a hold of good technologies. And I'll give you a couple of examples. In Syria, if you have antivirus software, which is very important because some of these attacks are malware attacks, you can't update your American-made antivirus software because of the US law that blocks it from being updated. So that's worse for Syrian activists. Up until a few months ago, Syrian activists could not get a hold of Google Earth because it was under sanctions. They can't take the, um, you know, the, the, all of the electronic tests, the SAT, the um, uh, GRE, the the TOEFL, they can't take the electronic version because of sanctions. There's all sorts of sanctions from the US that affect good technologies. And actually, the best story of this, which uh, I'm, I feel very lucky I have this person on my South by Southwest panel next March. There was an Iranian-American girl, who, a woman, sorry, went to an Apple store, uh, wanted to buy a laptop, and the Apple employee would not sell it to her because she was Iranian. She was an American citizen, but they were they, the law is so restrictive. That employee, had he actually sold it to an Iranian whose intent was to bring it back to Iran, he could have been fined up to a million dollars or 10 years in prison just for selling a laptop that would be exported to Iran. So our sanctions, uh, and I'm, I'm not 
wholly against sanctions, but I'm very much opposed to these sanctions on technology because they do so much more harm than good. And I think that that's true about Ericsson too. Now, there should be specific, very specific sanctions on, for example, the technology that's used in Yemen to block websites. That technology has no other purpose. Its sole purpose is for censorship and that should never be sold. Now, the second point that I wanted to respond to is something you said earlier about democracies and surveillance. Now, again, I can't speak to Sweden, but I think that we need to be very careful when we talk about what kind of surveillance can be allowed in democracies, because in the US, we have this horrific war warrantless wiretapping being conducted by the NSA, along with AT&T, they're completely um, complicit in it, and the Obama administration has blocked every attempt for access to information requests. And this is without a warrant, it's spying on American citizens who have no, I mean, there's no cause for them to be spied on. And so while Sweden might not be going that far, the US is absolutely, they've crossed the line beyond what a democracy should be able to do, and it's utterly shameful. And this is the kind of thing that China can point to and say, well, the US surveils their citizens pervasively, so can we. And that's where I think the problem lies. It's not with the Nazi content. I think, I mean, I, personally, I would rather see openness and see speech combated by speech, but I can understand the context of Germany. Um, but I can't understand my own government spying on me without a warrant. No, but th th I agree fully. And we have, we'll have our legislation now tried in the European court in, in Strasbourg. So the Swedish legislation will be, be looked into very, very seriously. And, and it will be very interesting to see whether it will pass or not. Because it, if it will not pass, then we will have to change it. You and, mean the, surveillance, and, the Swedish surveillance law? Yeah, yeah. and the implementation is controlled and uh, by parliamentarians. Mm. So they are not allowed to do anything that is not transparent towards the parliament. But I, I think that I agree fully that the open societies also need to be very careful on this. But I think it's, it's, it, it is a huge, uh, this can be done in open society. There's also a huge difference between legislation that is there to protect freedom and legislation there which is there to undermine freedom. I, I just, uh, can I just a minute, uh, I'd like to turn to Christian first and then you'll get the word. Uh, Christian, you, you, you mentioned the concept of, of technology utopianism, I think, earlier yeah. here. here. Um, uh, could you elaborate on that? I mean, will, will this uh, uh, export and, and, and uh, development of Western technology in the end, as Olof is implying, lead to more freedom, mm -hmm. more democracy? Yeah. I mean... I mean, I get accused sometimes of saying, like, so you're against freedom? I'm like, no, I'm, I'm not against freedom. But, uh, but I mean, I, I think that uh, it has, there's a term called liberation technology, which is the idea that just simply access to certain forms of technology somehow automatically lead to democratic expansion, free speech rights, and, you know, you'll, you'll suddenly turn into Sweden or whatever country <laughs> you want. Um, and, and, I mean, that, the problem there is that it's, it's what we call, within academic terms, a techno-deterministic perspective. In other words, it's the technology that's the driving factor and not socioeconomic or political or policy questions. It's like saying that there's, <coughs> that, that there's different forms of capitalism. There's Swedish capitalism, there's American capitalism. I think there's capitalism and there's a way that you regulate capitalism. And that's the thing that makes something Swedish or American. That's the same thing with access to technology. Technology itself is a tool that can be used in many different ways. And the problem with techno-utopianism, it, it, it tends to see one side of the use and pro probably maybe not the other. And of course, there's, there's, an, there's an opposite side to that argument, which is that there's sort of a techno-skepticism, which just sees uh, technology as something inherently bad. And both of these positions, I think, lose context and texture, and they really don't help anybody in these discussions. And within academia, you've seen these camps develop between the techno-utopians and the techno-skeptics or the debunkers who basically uh, are fighting with each other over ground on the extreme sides, on the left and on the right, or you know, not politically. But, but, the, but they're kind of, the positions don't really tell us anything, because no one is arguing that technology makes you free, really. And no one is really saying that access to technology is naturally bad, and because everything happens in the middle. And I, to, to get back to this discussion here about the, the companies, I think one of the problems is that you have seen a series of these arguments being made by Nokia Siemens, by Ericsson, by different companies, and their answer is always the same, which is essentially, uh, this, you know, it's not the intention of this, this is standard material that we sell in our, all of our <laughs> cell phone packages. The problem is if we're gonna have that transparency on the government side, we need to have tr corporate transparency as well. That's the problem. When, when news comes out about, uh, let's take Nokia Siemens in Iran, deep packet inspection, 
it comes as a surprise maybe to people that this is part of a standard cell phone package, as they're arguing. Obviously, there's a limited transparency on the corporate side. And I think we are expecting transparency in the political realm. Well, in that case, if we're going to have the sort of good, honest discussions about what companies should and shouldn't do with different countries, there should also be transparency right off the bat about the kind of things that are bought and sold. If it's not a problem, then you should have no problem telling me what you're selling. If there is a problem, then I begin to get suspicious when I don't know about it. And I think that's the way in which a lot of citizens react. Jillian's point about the use of technology is absolutely valid. Of course, you need cell phones to, to communicate. Dissidents need this technology. But then let's have an open and honest discussion about it instead of finding out about it after the fact that actually this was sold. And then you get this kind of reaction where citizens are, you know, they're disturbed by what they're hearing. But if they know about it in advance and there's a logical, clear argument being made about why it's necessary, then you avoid the problem. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Afra? Uh, I wanted to take up from uh, what Yirlin said about uh, uh, how the U.S. is becoming closed society, and uh, and the like, the the growing uh, level of uh, censorship. I mean, uh, it it, it yeah, it's relative to their uh, context. But uh, what I know for sure that. Uh, uh, the, the U.S. censorship is having uh, an influence inside Yemen. Uh, uh, one of the, the leading journalists uh, in Yemen, uh, his name is Abdel Ilah Shaya, uh, who's right now in, in, in prison, uh, having a, a five-year sentence. It's been two years since his, he was uh, in prison. Well, his, his uh, problem was that he was one of the, the outspoken journalists speaking about the drone strikes uh, 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 crimes uh, on civilians inside Yemen, targeting civilians, innocent civilians, in the name of fighting uh, on terror. Uh, US, uh, uh, the U.S. Ad administration uh, during uh, Bush uh, uh, arena was not a uh, lot of in favor of drone strike as much as it's uh, during Obama's uh, uh, period. Uh, apparently, Obama has been very creative with uh, inventing the kill list uh, uh, that I, I have no idea about. Like, what... what so what, what, what is he thinking? I mean, the kill list that, that any drone uh, strike attack could, uh, like, uh, with, uh, um, with, any, um, with, with a personal order from him, could kill any militant uh, groups uh, inside Yemen, Pakistan, and Somalia. So Abdel Ilah Shaya was very critical of uh, those uh, uh, missions by the drone strikes, and he has been traveling in the south of Yemen where most of the drone strikes takes place, and he has been interviewing uh, a lot of militants uh, from Al-Qaeda and, and exposing what the Yemeni government is cooperating with the U.S. government in, in, uh, in killing civilians uh, under the name of killing uh, the militants. With, with one drone strike, there could be one militant being killed, but on the other hand, around 20 uh, uh, women and children would be killed at the same time. So Abdel Ilah Shaya was on the media publicly saying that this is what's going on. So they in, he was uh, kidnapped from his house by the authorities, and he was put in a very uh, 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 not professional uh, uh, court at all, and he didn't have the chance to, uh, to have his own uh, lawyer or anything, and he was put in, in prison for five years. So during the protest uh, uh, in January 2011, uh, in, in, uh, in Tunis, uh, uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh, the, the ousted uh, president, uh, came with uh, a lot of uh, decrees uh, to appease the nation. And one of them was that Abdel Ilah Shaya was, will be free because the journalist syndicate was very active and other uh, uh, activists were very active in advocating for his case that he should be released uh, as soon as possible. So uh, uh, president, uh, 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 former President Saleh said, OK, he can, he can be free. And he, he had a final court a trial where Abdel Ilah Shaya was expected to be freed. But after a personal call from President Obama, Abdel Ilah Shaya is kept in prison till today. And he called uh, himself, he called and said, do not get him out of prison. He was a threat to what the, U the drone strikes are, uh, are doing inside Yemen. So, and I remember this clearly. I was at the newsroom, and my chief editor was entering, and he told me, and I was very like, 
really uh, happy that he will be freed. And he told me Obama refused that Abdel Rashai is out. So it, it's not only that they're, they're censoring uh, a lot of, uh, it's, it's becoming a, a closed society, but also the impact is also seen in Yemen. Well, so what you, you're pointing out here, Afra, is that, the, that we have this balance between freedom and security. And, and uh, basically what you're saying is that the Western countries are for freedom as long as it's not uh, threatening in their own security, if we could well, put it that way. Uh, I've, I would always believe like that uh, till Abdel Shaya is out. Yeah, I Other, And then I might it's change the mind. I, I think uh, Olof was uh, first for a comment and then Gillian. Yeah, I, I think we should be agree on the fact that freedom is there to protect, uh, or security is there, to, should be there to pre protect freedom and not the other way around. And I think that is a very important aspect on this. Another aspect which I think is very, very important is that there is a clear difference between rule of law and rule by law. And this is something that we have to tell some of our friends in, 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 in authoritarian countries because they say that, oh, we have a legislation here. And then if the legislation is, is, is not according to human rights standard, they don't care. But uh, legislation <coughs> uh, according to human rights standards should be legislation that reflects rule of law, not necessarily rule by law. But let me say one thing about the technology. I think that it's quite obvious that technology has been liberating people uh, over the, since the first scientific revolution, definitely, but also before. Of course, all technology can be misused. But what, what, is, what is software? Is software uh, technology or is it social cultural? Mm -hmm. I would say it's more social cultural than it's, 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 it's technology. But, and it's the software that drives everything. Mm -hmm. The hardware is stupid, it's dead. But the software, it's a software revolution that was started with Alan Turing and John Neumann, that drives everything. And that multiplies our brain capacity and it empowers people. And the liberating forces is the empowering of the people. And that is what we see right now. Mm -hmm. It's a threat for some, but it's an opportunity for most of us. Thank you, Olaf. Gillian? I just, I just wanted to, to just add a little nuance to the bit about the US because I don't know that I agree that the US is becoming a closed society for Americans, for, for people in the US. I think what we have is a situation where since 2001, um, since 9-11, we've had a convergence between, because you know, we are a two-party two system, a convergence between those two parties on security that has gone too far, but because Americans have very little influence over foreign policy, we have a lot of influence over our domestic policy, I really believe that we do, um, from the local level on up, but we have so little influence on our foreign policy, and these two parties are converging together on things like drone strikes and warrantless wiretapping and surveillance and all of these different things that we can speak freely against them. My organization does it every day, and we've never, you know, I mean, we're probably being spied on, <laughs> but we've never been arrested, we've never been, you know, we're not being cracked down on. But what we don't have is a real political opposition saying these things are wrong. These drone strikes are wrong. What we're doing in Yemen is wrong. What we're doing surveilling our own citizens is wrong and exporting these technologies to help other countries do the same thing is wrong. We just don't have that. And so I, I want to maintain that we are free. We do still have free expression in the US. I firmly believe that. But it doesn't necessarily matter. I can talk all day long, but it doesn't have any influence over these very specific issues. And I think that that's what's so key, is we have to find a way. And these technologies can enable us, they can, if we do it right. But the technology itself is not going to fix the problem. It's we have to create a different culture where we're speaking out against these issues and using the technology to do it. Thank you, Gillian. Mm -hmm. uh, does anyone have a watch? I, I didn't bring one. <laughs> We're eight, eight at about past. five past. Mm -hmm. Five past three? Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, uh, I would like to move on to another uh, subject, uh, and that is the international implica implications for freedom of speech uh, from the conflict between WikiLeaks and the US. Mm -hmm. um, Christian, I'll turn to you first. Uh, what will be the legacy of, of WikiLeaks when, when these uh, uh, cable gate and, and all these uh, war diaries were pub published? Mm -hmm. uh, there was a feeling that uh, now the world is changing for good. I mean, now comes the age of transparency. And right. 
no one, no, uh, every, every, uh, every, uh, every government will be held, open account open or, uh, held right. accountable from now. Right. Uh, how should we look upon this now? I think there was a moment a couple of years ago, uh, or 18 months ago, when it really seemed interesting, at least as an American. I mean, I'm an American myself, although I live and work in Sweden. That I think that there were discussions that were taking place, at least at certain levels within American journalism and society, about the nature of the relationship between citizens and states when it came to warfare. I think that the release of... Uh, I mean, this, this itself might be a slightly utopian understanding of what happened. But I mean, I, I got the sense that there was at least some kind of discussion that I hadn't heard before as an American taking place after the WikiLeaks releases. I think that discussion has died down considerably, to be honest with you. Um, I think the more important legacy of WikiLeaks might be, as I mentioned earlier, what's happening with Bradley Manning. Because I think that has longer, wider implications for freedom of speech and freedom of the press in the United States. And I think if you want to point to one American action that other countries can point to and say, if you're doing this, then who are you to tell us how to treat our whistleblowers? If Bradley Manning was Iranian, if Bradley Manning was Chinese, the United States government would be all over that case, pointing at it as an example of the suppression of freedom of speech. If Bradley Manning was an Iranian who had released information about the Iranian military taking part in activities that could be constituted as a war crime, whatever you think about the release of Bradley material that Manning released, you can bet that the US government would be incredibly interested in him as a person and as a symbol of freedom of expression. In the United States, and I think that, I mean, in Europe in general, I think there's been a rather depressing silence about the way in which he's been treated. I mean, the guy's been in solitary confinement for two years with no trial. He is not allowed to wear clothes at night in case he kills himself, so he has to appear naked in the morning. If you heard this story and replaced the United States with Iran or China, we'd say, see, typical. Right? But this is America that we're talking about, and I'm an American citizen, and I find it very embarrassing that a country that calls itself a democracy can keep a person for this length of time. Um, of course, there are security issues about the information they release, and I mean, everybody understands that. But at the same time, if you are going to take the position that you are a world leader on democratic questions, I think that the legacy of WikiLeaks won't be necessarily be the Assange case. It might not even be WikiLeaks itself as an organization, but the ways in which US politicians have politicized the Bradley Manning case and the potential of actually going after journalists now for publishing leaked material. Because if you classify WikiLeaks as a journalistic organization, the logical extension is any journalistic organization that then publishes leaked material can be fair game for prosecution. And that is potentially a much more damaging legacy in the United States than anything else that WikiLeaks has released. And I think that that really might be the long-term impact. And I think what's been lost in the Assange case and all the discussions about Sweden, this has kind of drifted off into the background. And the front pages about WikiLeaks have dealt with something completely different. Yeah. WikiLeaks is an important organization in my mind particularly as a U.S. citizen. We had a war going on in, uh, well, an occupation going on in Afghanistan and Iraq where most U.S. citizens were not really clear about what was going on. The United States military claimed that they weren't doing body counts. It's a very, very famous quote from, from uh, General Franks. It turns out they had very detailed information. We saw video released of civilians <coughs> being killed from airstrikes in Baghdad, very famous, that was made in Iceland. Um, and I think that that was seen as the important legacy of WikiLeaks, the exposure of military misconduct and war crimes. But actually, as time has gone by, the irony is the really important question of WikiLeaks is one that sort of drifted off, as I said, into the background, which is the Bradley Manning case. And I think the results of that and what happens in the next six months or a year could be very, very influential on U.S. legislation. So that's the one thing in the United States, and I think internationally it is used as a classic example of a double standard. I, Gillian, are you working in any way, EFF, with the Bradley Manning case? Uh, no, EFF is not working on the Bradley Manning case, no. um, but there are you know, a number of us that are passionate about this in our free time. And what I would add to that is, you know, I mean, you can, the U.S. government can legitimately make an argument that he broke the law. Mm -hmm. They cannot legitimately make an argument for denying him a swift and fair trial, mm -hmm. for keeping him in solitary confinement, for um, suppressing uh, information in the case, which has been done numerous times now, for keeping journalists out of the courtroom. All of that is just 
beyond reproach in my view. Um, and I think that when we look at WikiLeaks, I mean, for me, the long view is not so much the importance of WikiLeaks itself, but the importance of these initiatives broadly, leaking initiatives. And there are new ones coming up. There's global leaks. There's going to be others. Um, I think that that's where we're going to see a lasting impact. I mean, obviously, you know, I don't think anyone can say that there aren't a number of problems around the cult of personality of WikiLeaks. And I've got a lot of things that I could say about that that I won't bother. We don't but, go into that now. But, but, but that's, I mean, to me, that's not important because the legacy is the fact that this was a journalistic organization mm -hmm. that got leaks from someone in the military, uh, allegedly Bradley Manning, um, because he has not been tried mm -hmm. yet, and so I will not say that he's guilty. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, publish this information. And, you know, the Obama administration, what kills me about this is that they're talking about WikiLeaks at one side of their mouth, and then you've got White House officials mm -hmm. leaking information to the New York Times every single day. All of these, you know, the New York Times quotes an anonymous source every day. I'm sure you saw a couple of days ago the thing about um, Iran and, and the talks on the nuclear program, and then the Obama administration denies it. When they deny it that hotly, and yet they've got an official telling it to the New York Times, you kind of know that it's happening. Um, and so I think we've got this huge double standard going on. And the biggest problem around this is that it's become absolute status quo, that anyone who sticks their neck out about Bradley Manning or WikiLeaks gets, on, gets watched. I mean, the thing is, you know, I, I agree. Um, someone made the point that, you know, these most of the legislation in the US is meant for to preserve freedom. And I wouldn't necessarily argue with that, but that's not how it's being used. And we see people like Jake Applebaum, every time, the American citizen who has previously worked with WikiLeaks, every time he flies back into the US, gets detained, gets detained in Iceland, um, in their little you know American questioning room. It's horrific in my view. Um, and you know, I feel at this point that when I fly back into my own country, I shut down and encrypt my computer. I, you know, I'm careful now about what I travel with. I'm careful about my devices. I won't travel with certain things because who knows? And, you know, I can FOIA myself, uh, Freedom of Information Act in the U.S., but I have, number, I have numerous friends who've done that and gotten papers back with black marks on them mm -hmm. with stuff that they can't even know about themselves. Yeah. And that, to me, is an absolute abuse of power. Can, can I just quickly also say that one, one of the things that's... Um, Bill Keller, the former editor in New York Times, made a very interesting statement. They had a very close relationship with WikiLeaks, and Bill Keller suddenly discovered that he didn't like Assange or WikiLeaks a few years later. I mean, he's been sort of denigrating him. But one of the interesting things he said was, he sort of derided WikiLeaks and said, well, we thought this was going to be an age of transparency. But actually what has happened is WikiLeaks has led to a greater age of surveillance and security. So he was essentially blaming WikiLeaks, saying, if you hadn't have released all this material, you can't, you know, you're responsible essentially for an increased surveillance on the part of the U.S. government, which I think is a very, very odd argument, to be honest with you, from a journalistic organization like the New York Times, which claims to be the paper of record. And I think that this very antagonistic relationship between WikiLeaks and the press points to, I also think, structural failures in the United States of the media. I think that the antagonism towards them is in part sh schadenfreude, uh, that, that WikiLeaks beat them to the punch on some of the biggest stories in the world for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Olof, you had a comment? I think it's a, it's a, it's a comp question of competition. You find for the, high, uh, the, 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 the commanding heights, actually. Mm -hmm. and, and this is the fight between new media and old media. Uh, and the, we see it in, in, in here as well. Uh, I think this is a very, very important discussion to take, actually. Uh, um, uh, how do the state act to protect uh, uh, individual freedom in, in, in open societies? Uh, you have your system with the uh, uh, Supreme Court that, are, that is supposed to take care of, of these kind of, of, of problems. Here in Europe, we had a very, very severe discussion after the Second World War, which ended up in the, in the European Court in Strasbourg. And um, if we would have a bread... Man well, Manning case in, 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 in Sweden, for example, we would immediately have been taken to Strasbourg and Stra the, the judges in Strasbourg would have said that this is not acceptable, this is absolutely uh, unacceptable from a European uh, standard. And I think that what we need to do is um, to discuss the, const the, the consti uh, constitutional protection in the light of new technology. Uh, more thorough than we have done so far. And, uh, and uh, we have a number of, of discussions going on uh, based in, in Strasbourg in Europe where we look into this. Uh, but uh, we are definitely not ready. And the technology is advancing much faster than the constitutional 
legislation is developed. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, it, I mean, you could say that the WikiLeaks is, is, is not only an, an, a, a problem that is based on technology, because the WikiLeaks problem could have been even during the old technology. Yeah. It could have been very much the case after Watergate, for example. But um, uh, still, these kind of problems always pop up, and every generation has to do its homework here, I would say. I w used to say that every, every generation needs to read Karl Popper's The Open Society and Its Enemies in order to understand that the fundamental questions that were put <coughs> then are still put today and should be asked today. Thank you. Afra, from a Germany or Middle East perspective, what has WikiLeaks meant? There were a lot of uh, influential documents being leaked uh, concerning women. Mm -hmm. uh, most of them about the corresponding uh, letters uh, between the, the US ambassador in Yemen to the Washington DC uh, administration. <coughs> And most of them were discussing about who's really owning the state or who's really having the power struggle with uh, President, uh, former President Saleh. Uh, and they were very popular, like those documents were very popular and they were uh, on, on the, the local media being discussed. And later on, um, uh, the websites could get blocked or <laughs> hacked or, but, the, the state or the officials never uh, um, denied or, or agreed or anything. They, they remain uh, an open question uh, mm. inside Yemen. Mm. Mm. Thank you. How, what is the time? Uh, 20 past. 20 past. 20 past. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll, uh, there are some more questions or issues on, in my papers, of course. I knew this would happen. But I think we should uh, dedicate the uh, last um, 10 minutes then to questions from the audience to the panel. So please feel free to ask. We will, you will get the help with the ma microphone here. It's a bit hard to, for me to see here in the uh, spotlights if we do have any questions. Okay, we have one over there. Please, sir. Thank you. My name is Pash Jembek. I'm the editor of Natopia and I was on your panel last year, Hans, yes, uh, at this conference. I'll be on a panel at four, but I don't want to plug that too much. Sorry, <laughs> my, my question is for Olof Ehrenkrona, uh, and I'd like your comment on uh, the Swedish part government-owned telecom operator Telia's activities in uh, places like Azerbaijan, Uzbekistan, uh, Belarus, etc., where they have been collaborating very closely with the, the government to uh, monitor dissidents. Please, Olof. Yeah, um, first I would say that there is an investigation going on now. Uh, they have uh, asked the law firm to look uh, to what they are doing uh, in certain parts of the, this, um, and, uh, uh, which means that we are not fully upda up, uh, updated on it. But um, let me say in principle that we believe that uh, Western companies should be able to deliver telecom equipment in, even in countries with very difficult regimes. One reason is, we, we have discussed it before, that we, we believe that it's, it's beneficial for the people. Another <coughs> reason is, of course, that if they don't do it, there will be other, countries from, uh, other companies from other countries, and we can be sure that they will not have any hesitations to provide those kind of regimes with whatever equipment they ask for. So, so that is one reason. The, the second problem is, of course, that uh, as a government, we always must respect the principle that a company that works in another country must respect the laws of that country. That, that is a, a fundamental thing for every country. Uh, every government must, mu mu must have this position. And, of course, it's very difficult for a country to say that, or a company to say that we will not follow your, your particular laws. But there is also a space which should be used uh, in order to try to promote uh, better conditions. Uh, and there is always a space where you can say, no, 
we don't do it because it's not in accordance with international uh, human rights law or it's not in accordance with the law we have back home or whatever, whatever. And I believe that every decent company must work according to the rules, rules that are set up in the international community. We have these uh, RAGI uh, codes, for example. We have a, a number of codes for, for companies uh, producing, um, uh, for example, textiles in Bangladesh, whatever. That even if you are supposed or you should uh, follow the laws in the country, there is a space where you must always try to push the frontier in a liberal in a way that liberalizes the country and uh, not the reverse. What Telia has done and has not done, uh, I'm not an expert on this, so I can't make any judgments, but I, I think it's quite clear that companies should not be in countries with with authoritarian or regimes or dictatorships and just playing along. They should always, if they are there, they should have the responsibility to try to make things better according to international human rights standard. Thank you. Any other questions out there? Yes, we have a gentleman over there, please. Um, okay. Hi, I'm Linus Nordberg. Um, I'm hearing, Erin Kruna, you saying that um, Sweden should sell these things because otherwise someone else will. That means that we are a bit better than the other ones? Uh, that's my first question. The other second is, if we are a bit better, I mean, are we expecting these commercial companies to be better just because we think that they should be? Or should Sweden as a state try to impose laws or rules or influence these companies to actually be better than whatever is not good enough? Uh, yes, I could say yes on both issues. We are, I, I would say that we are better than, than certain com companies in other countries with regard to corruption standards, with regard to, to standards of, of, of equipment. Uh, but that goes for many other countries, the companies in, in, in Western countries as well. And that follows, so to say, the, the fact that they are brought up and they live and they work basically in, in, in open societies. But I also believe that it, it's good for those companies to have the support from their home countries or from the international, the, the international community and uh, the, the multilateral organizations. I mean, of course it's a, it's a it is not a bad thing to say, well, what you demand from us now is not according to the international human rights standard. It's not according to the regulations of OECD. It's not according to the regulations of WTO, whatever. So uh, I think that we should, we should be prepared to have, uh, to have international uh, uh, conventions or, 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 or agreements or code of conducts. Uh, in order to protect freedom uh, in, 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 uh, globally. Uh, and also, uh, to a certain extent, national legislation with regard to transparency, etc. Uh, I think that is, uh, that is one way to go. And I think that the companies do not necessarily feel this as a burden. They can actually feel this as a strength, that they can say, no, we are not allowed to do this according to, the, to, to this and this. And this is the way how some of the corruption legislation in certain countries works today, and I think that's not, not, not necessarily a bad thing. Thank you, Olof. Any other questions out there? Uh, I could, if, while you're thinking about good questions, uh, I could follow up with the questions on this one. The special thing about Telia Sonra is that is, it is uh, owned by the Swedish state, or the Swedish state is a majority shareholder. Um, and I mean, we had some big revelations by, by the Swedish television uh, investigative reporters at Swedish television this spring that uh, definitely added new facts and, and, and made it impossible for, for Telesonera to hide. But there had been warnings uh, years ago that things were probably not done the right way by Telesonera. Uh, how come the Swedish government reacted so slowly to this? 
I don't know whether whether the government reacted slowly or not. Actually, what, what uh, I mean it's always always a question of what you can prove and not prove, uh, and it's also a question of that you change person personnel, and one should remember that that Telia Sonora is is all, it's a company that it it is emerged merged between a Swedish and a Finnish com company, and and um, they bring different corporate cultures. They bring different staff uh, into the. So it's the know. fault of the Finnish. No, I don't say that. I don't say that. No, but uh, I would say that you don't not necessarily necessarily know exactly what ha what is going on and what has happened, mm. uh, because you 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 don't have the institutional memory that you can have in a company that com company that has been uh, grown up like uh, IKEA, for example, has mm. never merged with anyone. Uh, so it's 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 it's. Uh, I, I'm not sure that that one could necessarily say that the the, uh, the 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 representatives of the government in 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 in, in Telia has uh, been acting slow. But um, uh, what is important is that when things cup comes up on the table, <coughs> that it it must be very very clear. What is the, the, the what is the position taken by the government? And I think that is quite. I think Telia is, knows that very well now. If if they didn't know it before, uh, but then of course we must, must also be aware of the fact that though even though something has been presented in television or in a respected newspaper, there might be some some parts of the story that is not entirely correct, if I put it mildly. Uh, so is this something that you know that you should tell us? <laughs> no, but okay. uh, I, I know from other, uh, other thing, uh, stories that, that you always need to, need to very thoroughly look into these kind of matters before you make any, uh, any uh, hasty judgments. Okay. Do we have any more questions out there? Is there one up there? Yeah, yeah there we have one. Two. Two, actually. Please. Hello, my name is Christopher, and I have a question to all of you because you seem to be really positive to, Wik to WikiLeaks. Do you see any bad side of WikiLeaks? And one of you said it. It's a question of old media versus new media. But hasn't WikiLeaks been accused of putting innocent people in danger because they're not f checking facts and just putting information out there? May, may I respond first? Because I have to run off the stage in a moment. Sure, Yelena. OK, sorry, I'm going to have to run in just a second. But I would actually really like to answer that. Um, as for WikiLeaks putting people in danger, WikiLeaks offered. Now, and again, I am critical of WikiLeaks. You can read the things that I've said about Assange and about the cult of personality. but. WikiLeaks offered first to work with the State Department to redact names, and the State Department refused to work with them. Then they, they worked with journalists, and later on they did make mistakes in releasing names, but we don't have evidence yet that anyone's been put in danger. And in fact, I actually have six, six at this point, personal friends in different countries, mostly in the Middle East, who were named in WikiLeaks cables. And all of them have had some trouble because of it, either from the state or from whatever. But they, they remain supporters of the idea, if not of WikiLeaks and Assange himself. And I think that, yes, people's lives were put in danger. WikiLeaks made mistakes. The State Department made mistakes by not working with them to redact those names. But the issue there was a matter of, you know, WikiLeaks partnered with professional journalists. Professional journalists redacted names handled the cables responsibly. And then the real problem came later when that big batch got released after the fact. But, you know, I do think that there are responsible ways to leak that information, to expose the wrongdoings of governments whilst still protecting the people. Um, and the other thing that I would add to that is, frankly, as far as these diplomatic cables go, uh, having read many of them and seen the context in which activists in countries like Bahrain or Saudi Arabia were named, I don't understand why the diplomats 
had to put the full name of a person in the cable in the first place. If, if I believe, what's the number? 400,000 US officials had access to that? Yeah. I mean, okay, Bradley Manning may have been the one, and again, allegedly, may have been the one that leaked that to WikiLeaks, but what about all of the ones that just went home and talked about it with their friends? Those names never should have been in the cables in the first place. That's a mistake of the US government. And now I have to leave the stage. I apologize. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you, Gillian. Bye bye. Please. I think it's just a. I think you want to add something, Christian? Yeah, just just on the old media, new media question. I was actually going to answer the same thing that there's no evidence that anything's actually happened as a result of that. But in terms of the old media, new media, Gillian's point about the the interrelationship between WikiLeaks and major newspapers is a very important one because what it points to is, I think. A, a, a restructuring and a rethinking about what journalism is going to mean in the next 20 years. Obviously, news organizations can't handle the volume of information that WikiLeaks is taking in, and WikiLeaks can't handle the responsibility, the analysis of that information. So the way in which we think about investigative journalism as a media researcher, I think we have to think again, because I think what we're going to see is a lot more crowdsourcing of analysis. We're going to see a lot of dumps like this of information that require a lot more work than news organizations are willing to take on. And journalists are going to become more data managed rather than maybe investigative journalists. And groups like Anonymous, who actually provided a lot of the material, are going to be sources, but they're not necessarily going to do the analysis. So I think WikiLeaks, rather than maybe challenging new, and this is challenge between old and new, what we're seeing is WikiLeaks forcing us to rethink what we mean about journalism mm -hmm. in an era of what we're calling big data. Thanks. Uh. Did we have one more question up there? <laughs> we need to quit? Okay, I'm sorry. Um, then I want to thank you. S just just <laughs> last, last thing, I would like to invite everyone for uh, a seminar about Yemen tomorrow at Sudetarn uh, uh, Theater. Uh, at 6 o'clock, uh, we have the Yemeni Salon there, and we will be uh, having a visiting uh, activist from Yemen speaking about the foreign aid to the civil society inside Yemen. So you're more than welcome to attend if, if you can. Thank you, Afra, and uh, thank you all of you for coming here. Olof, Erin Krona, Afra Nasser, and Christian Christensen. And thank you all for attending. <laughs>